I'm really psyched for episode five of the documentary because it shows the struggles that we went through and then the successes that occurred over time by not giving up. So this one's about mergers and acquisitions. And as you know, this is something that's happening a lot in the ABA world. Uh, private equity and various funding sources are they're, they're pushing in billions of dollars into mergers and acquisitions. So the market consolidation is occurring rapidly. Now, this is something where we acquired an organization up in Maine, and the documentary you're about to see shows some of those struggles that we, we went through. And one of the biggest ones is culture. So uh, often in an acquisition or a merger, people are, are so worried about the money and, you know, is that going to be a profitable venture? It's, yeah, of course that's important. But what was important the most was could the, the New Jersey systems and the New Jersey culture, could that blend with the main culture? Because there are different things that those folks care about, believe it or not. And we're still in the United States, but we're, we're so many states away and it's very different. So this upcoming documentary, I'm really, I'm really proud of the, the work that uh, Jason Golaski, Diane, Jeremy, Renee, Bragg. So you're going you're gonna to see some pretty cool stuff. And uh, thanks for staying tuned. I've heard, though, some didn't require a nurse historically, but their behaviors were too severe, so we turned them down. Like, our company is built on severe behaviors. When we were building BDA California, I would walk into this coffee shop with a big-ass printer. No matter what, there's... Every person I meet, there's something in a conversation I learned from them. Agencies are spending, you know, thousands, millions of dollars uh, trying to get new staff on. Creating these opportunities again for people to see other people with the same interests as you, the same career path as you, like face to face, and being able to co collaborate, learn, and do all that. It's really important. It's sort of like you guys need to know about us to make sure you're, you gotta interview us. You know what I mean? It's like you guys interviewing us to see, are these guys right? We've, like, we all had checks bounced, like paychecks. I went for a while just not being paid. Um, because I was getting my supervision at the time, so for me it was it was worth not taking a paycheck just so I could get those hours accrued. Um, but I mean, ev to be honest, every single day there was always that chance of like getting a phone call in the morning, being like, "Yeah, just don't bother coming in today. We're you know we're shutting down. We're done." You mm -hmm. know, so that was always hanging over your head. So it was a real stressful time. Foolishly, I was convinced, not with with BDA joining, that not a single person would leave and I would have a hundred percent retention because mm -hmm. all we're gonna do is we're gonna come in and provide support not realizing how much we were shaking up the culture mm -hmm. and that was tough I mean I was so for a while like I thought I was failing I was like, what am I doing wrong that these people are just like pissed and some are leaving you didn't shake up the culture the culture was already shook it up it was someone was already broken um, like, I remember you coming in, and I was like, can we talk, can we talk, can we talk? Um, because there's some things I just didn't know how to deal with. It was a kind of a broken culture. There was a lot of people not working. There were some people that were really great team players, and other people that thought there was no, you know, there's no team here. It's just me or you, you know? Looking at it from a financial perspective, the, the previous owner had a very good vision in mind for how he wanted to support people uh, and, and kids and everything but the funding sources weren't lined up the right way. I mean, there was times where the reimbursement rates for the services were lower than like what the staff were even being paid. And we've been able to increase staff pay like 40% roughly, just making a number off the top of my head. And our reimbursement rates far exceed that now because we lined up the right funding sources the right way. So like, well, it goes to show you could have the best intentions in, in, in yeah. a business model, but if you don't have the best business plan, yeah. then those intentions go out the window, right? Yeah. right. And it, it, the, the way it was set up, he, he, he set it up in a way that, like I said, he just really wanted to help kids and their families and stuff. But like sometimes you need to put a little effort on those families to help you line up the right services to make it sustainable. Because mm -hmm. we looked at it and we said, all right, cool, like 
we could run this similar way. Like say, all right, say BDA purchased the businesses, we're just gonna let it run the same way it is. The doors would have been open for six more months. And I think that was, talking about like some of the rough patches, like that was one of the hardest things I'll never forget. One of the staff members said to me, um, you, you're just here for the money. That's all you care about. And I was just like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. She said this to my face, so it wasn't even mm -hmm. like something in passing. Yeah. And I said, like, listen, I, I, I can understand why you say that, because obviously I am talking about dollars and cents, but I'm doing that so we can keep the doors open for longer so these kids can receive services for, for much longer. All right, so we can yeah. service the kids better. You know, I can tell when, a lot of times with my staff now, when one walks into a room, I know that there's something up, mm -hmm. body language and stuff like that. And sometimes I can check with them right away, and sometimes I have to go, like, okay, let's go over here and talk, you know, because they might not want to talk in front of somebody or something like that, but, and work on that stuff. And a lot of times it was more morale against other staff members or something like that. So then I'd say, okay, tease that out and figure out like what I could do to help them either, you know, feel better, help them address the issues and try to, you know, change, you know, the dynamics. And some of the dynamics, well, unfortunately was in the past was, some people aren't still here because that it, you you couldn't some things you couldn't change. Teaching everyone how to get along, you know, it's okay to have conversations with someone if someone says something you're not crazy about, or whatever, just to you know talk that out or whatever. And so just boosting morale and stuff like that, and offering support. Well, it's such a big piece, and, and I think a lot of times in behavior analytic organizations, we forget that we can apply our own science. To, to what we do in our staff. And like, I'm hearing you're addressing setting events, like what was going on outside of the control of this agency. And we know, right, when we are addressing setting events, we need to take that into account just as much as some other, like, as like a function of a behavior in that moment. And that's how we can address it. You can't just take a carbon copy of what you do in one place and put it somewhere else. Um, Maine, which, you know, what we discuss, it has a completely different culture than, than New Jersey, than Pennsylvania, than California, Florida, Texas, and everywhere. So if you try to replicate exactly what you do and don't make any changes to, to the new area that you're in, it's not gonna work. I mean, to speak to our industry specifically, um, there, it's a heavy concentration of this field um, you know, in the areas th that we're in. And then you take it up to Maine, where one of the people we got certified as, a, as an RBT, or a registered behavior technician, they were the 15th in the state. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a whole different culture of really not even necessarily knowing what we do too much, so we kind of had to, to tell people and, and show people along the way what we can do to, to help people. One of the first things we did was we said, uh, we said all right, create a wish list for us of things that, that could help out uh, on like you know the preschool and stuff like that and we'll start plugging away at a couple of them and like on the wish list were like mountain bikes and kayaks and I'm just like <laughs> you're not getting kayaks I'm just like <laughs> I, like I, I get it that kids might want to go on a kayak but that's not important right now yeah. so I think it was like some of those <clears throat> things that almost came off of like promises of like just write it down BDA will get all of it yeah. and mm -hmm. it was just like well, that wasn't the case like let's let's go back and let's take a look at what we need and I always like I always say there's a big difference between want and need right so let's like, take a look at the things we need and make sure we have those things and then we can start chipping away at the things we wanted but we did I mean we had Jeremy Diane um, Renee as well go back and measure everything I mean one of the biggest report outs we were doing was how many billable hours there were in a single day and how many unbillable hours there were in a day because the funding sources were lined up so poorly that our unbillable hours were outweighing our billable hours. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just by a couple hours. It was like pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And now that we have like, outside of like admin and stuff, we have no unbillable hours. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So it was like lining that stuff up. So I know I do that report and I'm always like, how? <laughs> <laughs> so like we had to go back and I, I <laughs> I, every time I'd ask them to measure something else, I was like, oh my God, they're gonna hate me. Mm -hmm. And it was just like measure, and it would change like weekly as we would, as Diane eloquently put, we were just peeling back layers of the onion. Like we didn't know what we didn't know. And there were people, and I think one of the biggest difficulties for me, which I'm sure this is actually your specialty, um, was it was a very toxic environment. So the people didn't necessarily like each other. And when you have leaders who don't like each other, that's not good. You're never leaving us to go back to Texas, are you? To Texas? Yeah. 
I don't think so. No. But is there somewhere else you might go? Uh, I don't know. I've been in a couple of different Wait, places. Wait, what did you just ask her? Yeah, because she was in Texas before she joined us. So I was in... She's not going back. That's what I'm making sure of. I've I don't, been here forever. I don't, I don't want her to that. leave. I was in El Paso, and then we were, the company I was working for was opening a clinic in... New Mexico. Okay. And so we were like getting that started, and then just as that was taking off, I kind of left. But you're staying in Maine, right? You yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> okay, good. That's we'll that's there. all I was concerned yeah. about. Because you're mean, the you're the best, and we all know it. Thanks. I don't know if you were here before Angie took over the preschool, but like just like looks so much nicer. And I know like yeah. you're in there helping out a bunch as like yeah. the CC in there, and Quite I mean deep. the kids. I mean they're all in great shape. And yeah. just like even like the little stuff you said about central reach to Jeremy, just having that like knowledge like so yeah. fluidly, it's perfect. So you, you guys are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Well, thank you. That. I mean, it makes it nice. Everyone kind of works together as a team. And Did you say that? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to get anywhere near the, bus, uh, the stuff done that I do without her. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's awesome. You're the best. So Thanks. don't go anywhere. You're not going back to Texas. You're staying in Maine. I, I intend to stay in Maine. I, I naively thought that we would retain 100% of the people that um, were in the business that we acquired because I knew we were coming in with additional resources because the, the business that, that we acquired was really struggling. Um, their, their doors were going to close and we came in and um, you know, did the acquisition and began providing additional resources. And I thought, you know, we're just going to come in, we're going to be able to increase compensation, we're going to be able to provide all these additional resources and everyone's going to stay and everything's going to be great. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who have maybe done acquisitions before are probably laughing right now because unfortunately, no matter how hard you try, no matter how perfectly you do things, that's not the case. Culture is hard to cultivate, right? So I think it's like Mark Zuckerberg, one of those like uh, tech CEOs, talks about how you can't design a culture. You can, you can plan and hope for it, but the culture comes from the people. And as much as you could try to want something for them, if they don't go to it, then you're doing some things wrong. And, it, what, and to tie this back to what we're talking about right now, what I find like super cool about the way that cultures tend to form within BDA is the fact that it's always somebody modeling what the expectation is. Yeah. Reaching, out, reaching out to a staff member and saying like, like forget the fact that like, we're at work, like what's going on? Like let's, let's, it's a pairing process that then leads to like a truly emotionally intelligent conversation. And you know, maybe I had to take my BCBA hat off to say that word, but <laughs> yeah. like, but it's true. And that's that's really how you f foster a good culture is by making people feel safe. So you tell the story about this person who didn't feel safe here, and then over time when you guys have changed and and, and um, built up this space, she now can feel safe here, and that's huge. And that's what I was telling Jeremy, like, well, sometimes I have these organic conversations with people, like, hey, what's going on? And then all of a sudden they just start talking. Even if I did, they didn't look like they were off, I'm like, I check in with, try to check in with all my staff. And they'll say, oh, this stuff, hey, everything's going okay at home with this or that. Or then they'll start saying, but I need changes in my schedule or this or that, stress me out. And I'll go, okay, then I can also then filter it to who Switch it is. Switch your hat, kind so, of. So, yeah, and I'll go, okay, so then it's clinical, I'll send them to Jeremy, and I'll send it to this person. And then sometimes they'll, they'll say, I'll send them to like the staff, you know, someone to do scheduling or to Jeremy for the clinical, and they'll go, I didn't pick up on that. I'm like, you know, even if you're the mentor, well, sometimes you, you may not because it's like, it was an organic conversation that started over something else, and then, it, by the way, this fluid just came out, and it just was so fluid, and, you know. But that was something that you, like, I think all of us are inherently have some skill sets that are better than others, right? And for you, that was just always evident. Like, you know what I mean? You just have a way of working with people that can't, it's almost like they always say, like, Michael Jordan can't coach because he's just the best basketball player in the world, mm -hmm. and he can't actually take a look at what he does and figure like how to figure out how to teach that mm -hmm. for you making people feel safe and supported like you're the Michael Jordan of it mm -hmm. where like you just have this presence and like aura about you that people feel safe I can go to somebody like one of my mentees and and you know sit down with them and be like you know try to talk to them try to you know, see how things are going and they'll you know smile and nod to me the whole time and then the very next day Diana come to me like oh so and so just came to me they have this problem but I literally just <laughs> sat down and asked them yeah. what's going on how are things going is there anything I can help you with and they wouldn't tell me so I'm just not I don't have that skill set I'm not good at like getting people to open up to me and pry that information out well, they could, Diane's yeah. like a ninja <laughs> it's so interesting because if you actually track like that satisfaction graph and you compared it with our P&L 
you could you would probably see the lines line up pretty yeah. pretty and you know I think we were lining stuff up on the on the back end like you know the three of us and and Renee well to make sure that everything in the business was sustainable right but like you guys were problem solving every single day like even with the funding sources and everything to make sure that we were constantly going in the right direction because what we have now, I mean, we didn't just arrive here overnight. We slowly changed those things, making sure it worked for the staff, making sure it worked for the kids, making sure it worked for the family. Even if business wise, it wasn't the best financial decision, but for everyone else, it was going well. And we're like, all right, we can consciously know that that might not be the best business decision, but this is going to be the best way it works for, you know, employees, um, families and the children. And then just slowly change it over time, and then everyone's happy. Um, it's basically you're just consciously making a reinvestment at that point with just accepting a little bit of a loss. And just over time, we got it to exactly where it needs to be, and everyone's happy. Hi. Hey. Hey, playing Miss Jen today. Oh, cool. <laughs> playing with yes. Miss Jen today. Yeah. Is Miss Jen not, the best? Not yeah. bad for a yes. Friday. Yeah. <laughs> You got all that, Miss Jen. You can introduce everybody. Yeah. Miss Jen is the best. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're just gonna start like a Miss Jen chant. Miss <laughs> Jen. Miss Jen. Miss Jen. Jen. <laughs> so that's so you're more just like straight north or maybe a little bit west. Yeah. Okay. Like, well, yeah, it's north. Yeah. Guy. Well, I mean, because ultimately, like, our goal is to open up preschools, like, around more. So we were talking, like, the next step is to get closer to Portland. Yeah, I um, would be cool with that. I would be like, yeah, send me closer well, to Portland. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll need we'll need good people up there to, I'm to run it. I'm 15. Wow. I drive there and back, so I spend quite a lot of time in my car. Yeah. <laughs> is it, do you, do you do you at least enjoy it? Yeah, I do. I, like, it's like my like zen moment i like yeah. put on a podcast an audio book sometimes i do like no music at all because it's like you know after a chaotic day it's like nope we're just gonna drive yep. but just quiet drive so that's yeah. when you know you had a day right yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly so i'm like I'm <laughs> sitting, the sitting there in silence right. i'm stopping <laughs> and there's gonna be no music at all yep. yeah um, there's definitely those days but um it's my like peaceful moment of the day i guess Last time we talked, we talked a lot about some of the toxic leadership that was here before uh, the, the merger and acquisition that, that occurred. Um, so some of the follow-up I want to see is like, what's, what's changed in, in the past, I don't know, year or so? Well, I mean, we cut out all the toxicity, essentially, you know? I mean, it's, um, we, we had to kind of like drill down and figure out what the root of the problem was and just, you know, kind of get rid of that. And then once once you do that, it, it's really easy to like heal the rest of it when you don't have a force actively working against you all of the time. Yeah. So um, now once we made that change, got rid of those few people, um, things kind of worked itself out for a while. Yeah, well, that, I mean that that's that's good to hear, and it makes a lot of sense, right? You, you cut out the bad, and then you're left with good. Yeah, um, but. There, obviously, in a workplace culture, there are some things that kind of are, are residual and that are a bit ingrained. Did you have to start any initiatives, or um, did you do anything to get the ball rolling in the direction that you wanted things to be in? Yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, actually Jason implemented was a, like, um, a goal for us that if we worked an X amount of hours, like on a daily basis, like the whole team got a bonus. Nice. So, you know, it had kind of um, prompted that teamwork and, you know, everybody pulling their weight and doing their part and, and stuff like that. And I feel like that kind of helped bring people together a little bit. And we do, you know, we have like the, the badge scanning program. I mean, so we picked like a certain thing that that we want to focus on in the classroom and we have Angie walk around and, and Morgan and they'll, they'll scan badges and stuff and you know let everybody in the whoever gets like the highest scan for the day gets like a $25 bonus you know every day of the week and so it's you know we do all kinds of little things to try to keep the morale up and to, to keep things moving in the right direction and then of course if we see things not going that way we try to get to it faster <laughs> than before. Yeah. Well, see, I, I really like that a lot because there's like two things that I can see going on right there where it's like you have this gamification piece where it's like who can get the highest score. Um, but then you also have the ability to shift whatever that key performance indicator is, right? right? So it's like if we see like 
uh, people are showing up 10, 15 minutes late every day. You do that, you reinforce it on this variable schedule. Um, and then when that's all solid, the expectation is it's going to change. So like no one's upset that like, oh, but you changed the rules on yeah, us, right? right? Which is something that you see in a toxic workplace. When the employees don't know the rules, it becomes hard to meet expectations. Yeah. So by, by setting it up the way that you did, I feel like you got to, to, to basically let everyone know like, hey, these, like, these are the rules, these are expectations. If you meet them, everything's yeah. hunky dory. And we've also learned that um, um, kind of you know, explaining, though, kind of like the, the back end why we do some things to people um, helps them buy in more. And yeah. then letting them, letting them kind of weigh in on some decisions um, gives them also a little more feeling like you're listening to them and that what they think and feel matters to you and in your decision making process. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's some of the feedback that we had gotten. I mean, is this that like people. We'll make a decision. We'll just get feedback, kind of like through the grapevine. You know, people. You know, and it's purely because they have no idea what they're talking about. And I don't mean mm -hmm. that in like a bad way. It's just like they don't understand the stuff that's going on behind the scenes that mm -hmm. makes us, that drives our decisions. Yeah. And so, I I feel that then when we explain a little more of that to them, they're a little more accepting of some of the things they wouldn't normally be accepting of. Yeah. Well, I mean, transparency I think is important to. Most most people, because uh, when you when you don't see what's going on behind the scenes, you you make wrong assumptions because they just they, they just don't know. But there's a good amount of acquisitions that occur due to a business struggling, um, and that's where uh, you know somebody will come and, and you know acquire a, a business and take it over and, and begin making the changes and, and turn it into a successful business. The reality is though, if um, if you've ever been in a business that's struggling the stress that the owner might be facing really filters down to everyone. And a lot of those people just, it's a toxic environment. It's not healthy, it's not good. And unfortunately, some people live in that environment for too long, that when you do start helping and providing resources, for lack of a better term, it's like it's almost too far gone, where they need like a change in environment for them to be successful in their own professional life. It's like they, they have like stage four like terminal illness with us, but they'll be fine if they if they go somewhere else. So, you know, un unfortunately, that toxic culture just can't exist if, if you want, you know, everyone to thrive. And that's not only your clients, but your colleagues, um, your peers, everything. So toxic culture can exist for a business to be successful. Like I said, regardless of industry or anything, the toxic culture will be a very easy thing to to bring you down so those are probably the most important three things that, that i figured out along the way